Thank you for joining us for this presentation. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, a doctoral program, and two new online master of arts programs. If you're interested in learning more about us, please visit iwp.edu. Or to support the work of IWP, please visit iwp.edu slash donate. This evening, we'll be hearing from James Farwell about his new book, The Corporate Warrior. James Farwell is an author, attorney, and national security expert who has advised the U.S. government on global initiatives and actions, communication strategy, cyber policy development and authorities, and cyber security. He holds a BA from Tulane University, a JD in law from Tulane University, and a DCLS in comparative law from the University of Cam Cambridge Trinity College. He is an associate fellow at King's College London and a non resident senior fellow at the Middle East Institute in Washington, DC. He's a visiting scholar at A.B. Freeman Tulane School of Business. Mr. Farwell, welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. Thanks very much, Hannah, and thank all of you for taking the time to hear me uh, talk a little bit about my book, which I hope all of you have the opportunity to buy and read and above all to uh, enjoy. Uh, this is a book that uh, looks at military strategy and business strategy, what the military, and what uh, business leaders can learn from one another, and uh, tells the backstories of uh, how a lot of uh, startup companies became so successful, how companies like Nike uh, have become the epic successes that, that they have been. Um, I think one of the things that's important to understand, I'm gonna use some slides on these things, so, um, and I may go back and forth on these, but just to set the, 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 uh, the, uh, the context of this. Uh, the thing I think to, I'm, excuse me, I have to go. Sorry, I should have silenced that before. The thing I think to understand is the context, and that is that we live in a globally competitive marketplace. The world uh, presents a competition of ideas for both military and business. Uh, Sun Tzu remains foremost in the minds of military people when they think of strategy, and it ought to be foremost in the minds of business people. Uh, his point was that strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory, and that tactics without strategy are the noise before defeat. It's a concise, pithy comment and well-stated, true when he initially said it uh, many hundreds of years ago, true today. When people talk about strategy, they ask me, what is the starting point for strategy? <laughs> and this book talks a lot uh, about that. And uh, in interviews with people like General David Petraeus and Admiral Jim Stravitas, who is the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, he wrote the introduction to the book, as well as many other uh, uh, commanders, all of whom, by the way, are very outstanding people have asked me just how good are our top generals. And the answer is they're extraordinarily good. When you do a strategy, the first thing you have to do is to define success. What constitutes winning? In Afghanistan, we never had a definition of that, and it's one of the things that led to failure. And winning, it must be said, is not an all or nothing proposition. Chinese warfare notions, for example, seek only incremental advances. Beer marketing does the same thing. Small gains equal big money in beer, if you have, it's very hard to get people to change from Budweiser, say, to Coors or something. And if you were able to move the market by like 1%, statistically, that might not sound like a lot, but in, in point of fact, it would be an epic success uh, if you could do it. But incremental advances are very often uh, what you're looking for as opposed to a knockout punch. But in order to win, you always have to start with leadership. And good leadership, in my opinion, always starts with, uh, with, uh, uh, with values. Um, now, when I talk about values, this is what I'm talking about. There's several notions in this. The first is hard work. I once asked Mike Bloomberg, what does it take to be successful in business? And he said two things. One is that you have to work hard, and the other is that you have to understand that if you're gonna win the tough ones, you're as likely as not to win them by inches. And I thought that was a good lesson. You have to have discipline, excellence, loyalty. You need to forge teamwork. You need to have integrity and courage and persistence. 
If you can do that, these are the kinds of values that companies uh, that are most successful uh, tend to share. Values matter. And when we talk about values, we're talking about moral leadership. Uh, leadership that creates a winning mindset uh, uh, that works is what we're looking for. It's when your values aim to create a culture that improves lives. And what my book does is it uses a lot of examples to explain and show and illustrate how different companies and different executives, whether it's a startup company or a more established company, have applied these values uh, to uh, be able to do that. The Notre Dame football coach, uh, Lou Holtz, once said that life is 10% what happens to you and 90% of how you respond to it. And I think that that's true. Jim Stengel is a very distinguished uh, writer and thinker on uh, what makes companies successful. And he has a theory that uh, a winning culture is a culture that improves the lives of everybody. Uh, if you want to be successful and your company is not committed to improving lives, his opinion is that you don't have as good a chance of making it. He identified five different ways that successful companies might improve lives. Not that every company does all, of them, but they tend to do one of them well. They can elicit joy, for example, Coca-Cola or lent chocolate. They can enable connections between people. Starbucks uh, has positioned itself uh, that way for a long time. Federal Express uh, enables connections because you send packages to people. You can encourage exploration. And uh, that's really what Apple and Amazon stand for, the idea that through their technology, you can explore the mind, you can explore the world. You can evoke pride. People who drink Jack Daniels are proud of that. People who wear Calvin Klein, same thing. Or you could have an impact on society. Patagonia makes great clothes, but the thing that's interesting about their corporate culture is that they argue that when you buy their clothes, you're helping the environment because their clothes are environmentally uh, uh, friendly. Uh, Dove uh, created a, a self-esteem project for women that has been a, become a classic in corporate advertising. Uh, they challenged the prevailing uh, precepts uh, in the beauty industry and redefined what it means to be beautiful as a woman. And uh, so th those would be examples of the kinds of things uh, that work. And, and my book talks about examples like that. I think that Stingel was right although my personal opinion is that uh, uh, there's much more to it uh, than that to have a successful strategy. The most important thing, and this goes back to this notion of defining what winning means, you've got to develop a vision and go after it, and you have to do so, notwithstanding uh, what all the naysayers uh, say. Uh, let me see if I can figure out now how to share my screen and... Uh, I'll give you an example of that. Let's look at this uh, ad and then let's discuss it. The BBC is the first glorious anniversary of the ship formation for the history of Britain. Steve Bailey's history of knowledge, pure ideology, original On January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh, and you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. I don't know if any of you all have uh, seen this ad before, but there's a great story behind it. Uh, Apple in 1984 was on the verge of going bankrupt. And so Steve Jobs commissioned the film director, uh, Ridley Scott, who made the movie Gladiator. He's an Academy Award winning film director to make this spot. It cost a million dollars in 1984. You <clears throat> actually might be able to make it for less today because of CGI, but it was a fortune at that time. And it was not money that Apple had 
just lying around. It was something of a Hail Mary pass. So anyway, he makes the spot and then he brings it to a market research company to test it. He goes over for the results and they all gather around and they, and Jobs of course is expecting everybody to, to say what a great spot it is. And instead they said, you know, Mr. Jobs, we don't know how to say this, but this is one of the worst testing spots we have ever tested. And if you put this thing on the air, it's going to be a disaster. Well, needless to say, Jobs didn't exactly like that. So he left and he figured, well, I know what I'll do. I'll convene a meeting of my board of directors and uh, get their support. So he did that and showed them the spot and waited for uh, the applause and instead was met by stony silence. And finally, somebody said, Stephen, you're crazy. If you put that spot on the air, we're going to go bankrupt. Well, he had enough confidence in himself and in his vision that he said, too bad. I think I'm right, and I think all of you are wrong, and we're putting it on the Super Bowl, which he did. <clears throat> and two things happened. First, with this ad, artistically, the ad itself transformed the way a lot of people looked at advertising. And as to the company, Macintosh sold 250,000 computers within a week. In other words, Jobs had confidence in a vision that was concrete in his mind, and he was willing to stand by and fight for that vision and not capitulate to what other people thought. I think that there's a lesson about leadership about that, which is knowing who you are and what you want and being willing to fight for it. So again, that comes back to this notion of define your goal and achieve it no matter how tough. And in doing that, you want to inspire others. Uh, I always say this, and I feel very strongly about this. We all have our own, our own stories to tell and you have to decide for yourself that you're gonna be the hero of your own story. You want to be able to seize the moral high ground in anything that you do. Uh, but at the same time, while you work hard, you also, I think, have to be uh, very realistic about things. Um, here's an example, though, of what inspiration can mean. And this is an example of a spot uh, by Nike. And let me show you this spot. Let me see, do I have two spots by Nike in here? I have two of them. I'm going to show you both of them. Uh, and uh, we'll discuss how Nike has approached this idea. Maybe it's my fault. Maybe I led you to believe it was easy when it wasn't. Maybe I made you think my highlights started at the free throw line and not in the gym. Maybe I made you think that every shot I took was a game winner. That my game was built on flash and not fire. Maybe it's my fault that you didn't see that failure gave me strength, that my pain was my motivation. Maybe I led you to believe that basketball was a God-given gift and not something I worked for every single day of my life. Maybe I destroyed the game. Or maybe you just making excuses. Nike's theme is that you can improve your life through sports, but the narrative of all of its ads, and it makes tons of ads in every country. And in my opinion, Nike is the champ when it comes to making ads that drive its narratives. The, the ads are very inspirational and very brilliant. But the point of the ads, the story that they tell is that for each of us, 
we are our own hero and our own villain. For example, say you want to be a marathon runner. So we get all hepped up and we get out to the park and we run three miles and we keep doing that. But then one day it's cold and rainy and you don't want to get up and do it. And Nike's point is, if you want to be a champion, and Michael Jordan's point is, if you want to make it to the top, you really have to apply discipline and hard work and overcome that which is lazy within you, that which holds you back and grind your way through it. And once you do that, then you can, can break through and you can become the person that within yourself, you know that you can be, you can become a champion. And one of the things that my book does, and it was really fun to write about, is to discuss how Nike got started and how it saw itself and what it did in order to become a successful and how it developed its themes of, of hero villain uh, as part of its overall thing. And I find that really fascinating because it's not that unlike what happens in the military. Let's take Ukraine as an example. They say that battles are won in the heart. Well, if there was ever a time when that was true, it's in Ukraine. These people are outgunned. The Russians have more people. But what the, uh, the Ukrainians have is they have the will to fight, they have a cause to fight for, and they have the heart to fight. They have stout hearts. And that's a corollary uh, to what happens in, uh, in business and in life itself. And I think that uh, Nike is particularly interested in that respect. And my book, and one of the things about my book, if you buy it online, is that I, in the footnotes, I have links to the YouTube uh, 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 ads so that you can click on the ads and see the ads while you look up above and, and read what I have to say about them. And I think it's one of the things that makes this book worth the price of admission. It's just a lot of ads that I discuss. So anyway, that's one example. Let's go back to strategy and, 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 and some of the things that I talk about are the need to, when you have a strategy, you've got to define it in writing. <clears throat> This would seem pretty obvious, but the reality of it is that in most cases that I come across, people won't do it. You have to write it down. Uh, militarily in Afghanistan, we never had a strategy in Afghanistan. It isn't the only reason we lost, but it's one of the things that kept us from winning. Companies use what are called creative briefs, which combine strategy and creative ideas. Toyota, Procter & Gamble, a lot of the top companies that are not necessarily artistically spectacular, but very successful in business are successful because they know exactly what they're selling and who their audience is and how to reach and motivate an audience. Once you've written down a strategy, I think it's important that you review it. You have to get input from your team. You obviously, as I pointed out in number four, have to be adaptable, flexible, and agile and identify your strengths and weaknesses. And you have to be able to sustain what you're doing. And I also make the point in my book that one of the tip-offs of bad leadership are executives who shun input. It's my experience, both as a lawyer, a political consultant, and a national security consultant, that people that are in charge of things are fond of saying, you know, I need all your great ideas. And if I'm doing something wrong, I want you to tell me that. And the reality of it is that most executives hate it when you question what they think is the right thing to do. So it's just something to think about. And my book, again, talks about these types of considerations and, and the way that I think that you need to, 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 uh, to look at it. I think that in terms of building a strategy, you have to define the team and you have to define who you need to be able to succeed. And that's another thing that the book covers. Uh, teams need to be small enough to uh, function, uh, but large enough so that you can get real input from people. And you've got to decide who's essential, important, or not important, because you can't talk to everybody. And those are very subjective decisions. And, and that's another point that the book, uh, book covers. And I think it's very important to understand that. Ultimately, strategies that work define a credible rationale. And they communicate why a target audience should care. If you're going to buy an Apple computer or buy a razor from Harry's Razor, or if you're in England and you drink the uh, smoothie drink, Innocent, why is it that they should pay any attention to your advertising? You've got to ask yourself questions like that. And the book goes through the considerations that different companies that have been successful went through as they uh, tried to appeal to the emotional intelligence of their, their audiences. All of this means that you need to know your strengths and your weaknesses, 
those of your competition, um, and make sure that you don't mirror image. That is to say, don't assume that other people see the world the same way that you do. They may not. Uh, they may see it very differently uh, than we do. What's going on in Russia is really, I think, a really good example. There's no doubt that Putin sees the world through very different eyes than the rest of the world. Uh, in the commercial world, uh, one of the things that Apple has done in its advertising, you see them all the time in their funny uh, ads when they distinguish themselves from, uh, uh, from uh, PCs, is that uh, Apple is always chic and cutting edge and unconventional, and people that use PCs are using technology that is uh, stayed and, and obsolete and not so good. Uh, so they're very good about being able to say we're unique and the other side that we compete against uh, is not nearly uh, as good as we are. I can't show you the Eastwood ad, but I would encourage you to look at it on YouTube. It played on the Super Bowl. It's two minutes long. And we just don't have time to look at it. Uh, but if you go on YouTube, it's had millions of views and it's a wonderful ad that Eastwood himself wrote about Dodge and overcoming doubt. And that goes to the heart of understanding who you are and why you're special and why you're able to succeed. But here's an example of, a, of, of another ad that sort of makes the same point. I think that's a wonderful ad and it really illustrates why uh, in terms of your cultural, uh, of, your, of your corporate culture, it's really important to have a very positive uh, sense of movement, a sense that you can accomplish things that are difficult, a sense that when other people are not doing something, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't, it just means that you chart your own course and that you follow it. Part of this, and the book goes into this at length, is that you have to pay attention to cultural nuance because sensibilities do differ. Uh, this goes again to the point that you have to engage the target audience, both emotionally and intellectually. Uh, you have to respect the audience. Uh, feeling gives uh, a resonance to uh, what you're talking about, but it is not a substitute for substance. And I point out in the book that that's an important issue because a lot of people in commercial advertising uh, think that what you're trying to do is get people to feel good about your product. That's true up to a point, but I really think that you have to have, as somebody once said, where's the beef? You have to have something uh, that's real in order to, uh, to do it. And in each case, you have to be sure that you tailor what you're saying to cultural nuance. To show you how different things can be, I'm going to show you a, uh, 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 a couple of Japanese uh, things that... Uh, are just weird to a, a Westerner's view. Uh, this first one is uh, called Japanese kawaii. It, it doesn't lend itself to definition. Uh, and this is the, uh, the video that everybody points to uh, that explains, uh, you just have to look at it and get a sense of it.
かわいいとは、おまけてよくで純粋なもの。清少納言は、ヨカのソースにそう書いた。でもそれだけ、神様だけ、ゆるかわいいし、気もかわいいは正義だし。そう、かわいいはよいしょ。昨日の私は相手にされない。可愛い,いとは、期間を経て、永久不滅、絶対領域。可愛い,いとは、儚なく一瞬の灯火。そう、可愛い,いは、進化した文化財。今はクールジャパン、ファーストクラスで、平野国に。あれ私たちのかわいいはどこ I'm going to stop it right there. It goes on. What they're doing with that notion is it's an identification of a product with Japanese culture. And it's one of three ways that the Japanese tend to sell products.、Uh, a second one is that they, they love children. And so a lot of ads feature children. And the third thing is the Japanese consumers don't trust anybody, they're suspicious. And so they want to have credibility that goes behind、uh, an, an ad. And they, they hire a lot of American movie stars to endorse ads. You may have seen a movie some, a few years ago that starred Bill Murray, who went to Japan to make an ad for Scotch whiskey. Well, he was a really good example of that. In the movie, they were paying $2 million to make that ad. And、uh, that's really what they do.、Uh, but they figure that if uh, 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 a, a major movie star from the United States, like Tommy Lee Jones or Harrison Ford or, or Arnold Schwarzenegger or people like that who appear in these ads all the time and get paid a fortune for it, I think the ad is okay, that that gives it some credibility. France, on the other hand, is very, likes to use humor and it's quirky. But I think it's very distinct, and this would be a good example of the French approach to advertising. There's a whole series of these ads that were made、uh, with the message of take the train instead of getting stuck in traffic.、Uh, this is not the kind of ad that you would tend to see on American TV. You cer- certainly wouldn't see it in, in Japan. And I could take you through a dozen different countries and show you the different cultural nuances. And I think what's important is to understand that these nuances exist. And part of the fun of my book was looking at these things and then analyzing what they do and how they do it. And why they do it and what makes it work. And I think that's one of the things that's fun about doing strategy and looking at marketing.、Um, all of this comes down to the notion of strategic positioning.、Uh, I'm a great believer in what's called the blue ocean theory of、uh, marketing. You enter that part of the market,、uh, I've got, yeah, you know, where the competition is thin, you want to get there first.、Uh, one of the reasons that、uh, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. Became very successful with computers is that they were well prepared、uh, for the computer generation、uh, when, it, uh, when it opened up and they got the jump on everybody else. One could argue that other people came around that might have been just as talented, but Jobs and Gates were there first. So when Kevin Plank started、uh, the athletic company Under Armour,、uh, that was、uh, part of the challenge that he faced. Nike and、uh, Adidas and other people were in the market. And Kevin Plank came up with a great idea of instead of competing with shoes, 
he created a, a kind of sweatshirt that athletes like to use that absorbs sweat. And so he went into the athletic apparel market, but went into a segment of it in which there was no competition. Today, Kevin Plank, who literally started his business out of a garage, is worth about $1.7 billion. Uh, Cirque du Soleil, which you're probably familiar with, it's a, uh, a what I would call a theatrical circus, was really uh, brilliant in uh, what they came up with. I'll show you one of their one of their promo things, and then we can talk about it for a minute. Cirque du Soleil reinvented the whole notion of circuses at a time when the circuses were a dying industry. Uh, there was a great outcry against abuse of animals. Three ring circuses required the use of very expensive stars. So you had rising costs and a smaller market for it. So Cirque du Soleil came up with the imaginative idea of combining uh, the spectacle of a circus, but using acrobatics with the drama and the excitement of telling a story as in theater. And so they got people to rethink what it was like to go to the circus. Cirque du Soleil is a brilliantly successful company. And once again, instead of trying to compete with uh, failing companies, they just created a brand new market for themselves and caused people to reimagine what theater uh, could be. So I think that's a, a really important part of the blue ocean thing. Uh, another thing uh, that I think is very important when you do think about marketing yourself is that you need to uh, key your tone uh, of your ads to the target audience. And uh, Levi's was a failing company and it revived itself by being hit. Here's a good example. Sorry that on Zoom, these are uh, don't buffer as smoothly as one would like them to. That's not really a commercial that has still frames, but you get the idea of, of, of what's going on uh, in it. Um, another way to uh, create empathy uh, is through surprise. And Volkswagen did that uh, with its original Beetle commercials. And one of the things I think that's so interesting about the way Beetle thought about itself strategically, and I talk about this in my book, is that you don't have to be that expensive in your, in your production values. A lot of people think that too. I mean, Nike commercials can be very expensive or they can be not expensive, but uh, the Volkswagen commercials were not. And let me show you a couple of, uh, these are some of the original ones. Volkswagen stopped making the Beetle in 2020 
because competition from SUVs drove it out of the market. But the way that they thought about themselves and the way that they thought about appealing to people, I thought was very interesting. And again, it's the sort of thing that the book talks about. If you own an eight-year-old Volkswagen and have it washed every now and then, No, it's an eight-year-old Volkswagen, except you. I may have one more on here. Let's see. Yeah. Some time ago, the Volkswagen people went to see one of Italy's most famous automobile designers. They gave him this assignment. What changes would you recommend in the design of the Volkswagen? He studied it and studied it. Then he said, Ingrandire il finestrino di dietro. Make the rear window larger. Solamente questo. That's all. Solo questo. That's all. We did, starting with the 58. A Volkswagen is never changed to make it look different, only to make it work better. Um, another way that the book talks about is inspiring people to a cause, and Patagonia does that. Let's see if this is an end, yes. This is the greatest crisis of our time. I'm scared for my future. My biggest fear is that it's too late. The climate crisis is already here. Now is the time for civil disobedience. I strike because- Because my generation will be the ones impacted the most. I strike because I want to see change. Because I believe in the power my generation has to shape our future. And then finally, one of the things that I think is a, a very good strategy is that you can challenge the conventional wisdom and up in an industry. And Doug did that. Uh, Ogilvy Mather, which is one of which is a global advertising agency, did that. Uh, I'm going to show you this ad. And I, I, it may or may not buffer properly, so you may wind up seeing it as with these other ads in still frames. But it's worth just spending a minute to uh, talk about this. The fashion industry, as you might suppose, has always favored uh, models who are thin blonde and young. And statistical surveys show that about 80% of women hate the way they look because not everybody is young, thin, or blonde. But that's just what the $2 billion a year beauty industry uh, has sold as the standard for beauty. They completely changed that with their uh, self-esteem project to uh, inspire women to redefine uh, what constitutes beauty. And they had a whole program that uh, crossed from television to print to uh, internships to programs that they put on. And they showed that there is beauty in a very subjective way in women from A to Z. Uh, and that you have to look as it were, beauty is not skin deep. 
And for example, Dove uh, uh, doesn't in its advertising uh, do a lot of makeup other than just to take to make people look natural. Uh, it started with this ad, which was done not as a gag, but done sort of as a throw together thing by uh, uh, the crew making another uh, commercial for Ogilvy. <clears throat> and let me see, but what's important about the ad and why it had such an impact is that the ad demonstrated the, the uh, hype that goes into the beauty industry. Uh, the ad in its real form is very, very quickly cut. It's cut frame by frame, but let's see what it looks like on here. <laughs> So what this ad had an enormous impact. I mean, it was made for nothing, but it, it caused people to rethink uh, what beauty should be about. And the advertising campaign that uh, Ogilvy uh, launched for Dove uh, really had an enormous impact in, in the attitudes that women had about themselves. So just to step back again, I've really just gone through some of the wave tops that the book talks about so you get a sense of the contents of it. What I'm really doing in this book is looking at strategies, looking at the way that we uh, look at ourselves, look at audiences, how we apply core values uh, so that when people buy a product or a service, uh, that they uh, understand that they are buying quality, that they're buying uh, a group of people that really believe in something, that stand for something, that stand behind quality. And I think that that's really the key to being successful in life. And the military does the same thing in a different way. They approach it a little bit differently. And I thought that being able to interview so many incredible uh, flag officers uh, and getting their insights, and most of these officers, I might add, sit on the boards of companies, so they've seen it from both sides, uh, gives us insight into what it takes to succeed in life. If you wanna start your own company, uh, what's successful in, in that way, and what are the things that you need to think about? And the book, I think, is a lot of fun in the stories that it tells, the illustrations that it provides, and the overall thrust of, of what's going on. So in a sense, that is what the, and now I've got to figure out how to get, how to stop this, uh, which I'm sure there is a way. I don't know how to stop sharing. Oh, here it is. But anyway, that's the, uh, uh, what the corporate war is really about. And so if you're interested in understanding how to be a successful uh, entrepreneur, or if you've got a company that's going well, uh, how to make it better, uh, the book is not written for CEOs. It's written for business students. It's written for uh, people that are starting a company. It's written for people that are in middle management. And its main purpose is to cause you to think, to understand how to motivate people, to think about the things that you think are important how to define a vision and to articulate that vision and to show people that who you are and what it is that you provide is worthwhile. And that's what The Corporate Warrior is about. It's available on Amazon. And as I say, I think that you'll find it a great fun read. I think it's better to read it online myself so you can see the ads, but it's available in hardback and it's available in uh, uh, online. So with that, I've talked for about 45 minutes and I'm going to stop there and uh, 
take questions, which I'll be happy to answer, providing you promise not to make them too difficult. So thank you. <laughs>